G'day, I'm Jesse Fink. The author of Bond the Last Highway. You got it! And you're listening to Play That Rock and Roll. This is not a test. This is Play That Rock and Roll. I'm your host, Joseph K., and like the song at the start says, just call me Joe. Today, we have another guest, and it's our first ever returning guest. Last year, author Jesse Fink came on the show to discuss his then new book, Pure Narco. And today, he is back to discuss the new, updated edition of his masterpiece, Bon the Last Highway which details the final years of legendary ACDC frontman Bon Scott. Bon the Last Highway was originally published in 2018, and I got my first copy in 2020 when I was doing research for an early episode of this show, which was about Bon Scott. It was after reading that book that I decided I wanted to start having guests on this show. Because projects like these deserve recognition and support from music fans. And that's the stuff I want to talk about here. This is an incredible example of real music journalism. I have a bookshelf full of rock and roll biographies, but this may be the high watermark. So in the interview you're about to hear, we discuss the new revelations found in this updated edition of the book. We talk about his extensive research process, and we also discuss some of the insane backlash he has received from overly defensive fans for daring to challenge the official story of Bond's death. You can learn more about this new updated edition at jessefinkbooks.com, and you can also get your pre-order for this book in over at Amazon now or wherever books are sold. And you can also find Jesse on Facebook and Twitter. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Jesse Fink, author of Bon, The Last Highway. This is the updated edition of Bon, The Last Highway. Is this going to be the final edition of the book? I'll, I'll never say never, but, uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, I have, I have thought that, you know, look, I've written two, two books on ACDC. I thought, you know, maybe anthologize them into one edition at some point, you know, because oh, that's interesting because I think they, those books cover essentially for me, the most interesting part of ACDC's history, which is how they kind of made it in America and, um, you know, broke through with Back in Black and, and then Bon Scott's death. And, and then everything after that really is not that sort of fascinating to me. So, um, you know, but we're, we'll be coming up to the, oh, the 50th anniversary of, um, you know, the founding of ACDC is actually um, next year. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. And, and and it'll be 50 years since Bond joined in 2024, so. Okay. Wow. So uh, are you saying that we can't expect you to write a third volume called I Like Cars, the Brian Johnson story? <laughs> <laughs> what I want to accomplish in this conversation is I want to convey to people listening the sheer scope of work that goes into a project like this because that's really what grabbed my attention when i read it is that i have a bookshelf full of rock bios and you know some of them are just whatever you can find on the internet plus an interview with someone's ex's brother you know and somewhat slapdash and it almost kind of bothers me that like your book has to share shelf space with stuff like that because your book took several years. You were trotting all over the globe. You were talking to people who had never talked to anyone about, you know, their story before. 
you're talking to people who gave you conflicting stories and you had to sort that out. You know, if you can take me through like the early parts of the process, like when you decided this was a project you wanted to pursue, how did you decide this amount of work, this scope was the way for you to go? And then how did you set about doing it? Um, it's pretty much the process, I guess, with, with every book that I do is that I, you know, I sort of certainly amass as much uh, research as I can first. Because, the, you know, the, the, the bulk of the book is your research and, and, it's, and it's, the, it's the thing that takes the most time. I mean, the pe what people don't understand is that, you know, there might be 500, you know, footnotes at the back of the book, but, you know, one foot, footnote you can sort of labour over for one day just sort of trying to get the facts right, you know, or, or, or verify whatever it is, whatever claim, you, you know, is being made or whatever. You can just spend an inordinate amount of time on, on these things. And I remember reading, you know, someone had left a review on Goodreads and it sort of complained about, you know, the fact that, what was it, you know, 20% of the book was, was notes and bibliography. It was like, well, what the fuck do you want, mate? You know? What, honestly? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you that I've done the fucking work, you know? Um, you know, you just can't please some people. And, um, but... You, you know, you amass all this re research first and then, you, you know, you go through it and you kind of, you know, you use what you, what you can or what you, what you think is interesting. And certainly you don't want to fall into that trap of, of you know, that so many rock biographers do, which is just essentially paraphrasing other writers. Right. You know, there's just, a, you know, there's a, there's a rich vein of kind of these rock biographies, which are just essentially, you know, guys just rewriting other people's stuff. Yeah. And I, ne and I never wanted to do that. Um, so I sort of set out at the beginning of uh, Bond the Last Highway of uh, with, with, the, with the basic idea of, you know, Bond uh, being on the road in America and kind of, tracking Bon from the first concert in Austin in 77 through to um, Ohio in, at the end of 79. And, and, you know, tracing his American journey. Because my, my hypothesis essentially was that, you know, the road to Bon's death was his time in America, you know, his time on the road. Which, which is essentially the, the, the meaning of the, the title, The Last Highway. It's, it's the road that he took to his death. Right. Um, and so then, uh, you know, you, you, you do it sort of, you know, stage by stage. You sort of go concert by concert. So I literally had a, you know, a map of America, had pins, you know, where ACDC played a concert. I would then go to, you know, old billboard magazines from the 70s because they're online go through, you know, find where ACDC was being played on what radio stations, then find the DJs who were still alive from that era, who were on Facebook, contact them, say, look, did you ever meet Bon Scott? Did ACDC ever come through your studio? Whatever. And, you know, contacted about 100 of those guys and, and then five sort of came back with interesting stories. And one of them was a guy called Neil Mursky who was down in, um, who had been down in Orlando who had sort of interviewed Bon uh, in 1979, had a tape of, of Bon um, talking to him, which I put up online, um, which was, you know, like a eureka moment. But then he introduced me to some people that, you know, Bon knew in Miami, including his girlfriend. And suddenly it all opened up. So up to that point, I, I had kind of... Um, you know, been meticulously kind of plotting, you know, ACDC's journey, but it was very difficult to come into any new information. Um, you know, you, 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 might, you might get, you know, how many people were at the concert, where the concert was held, um, you know, a couple of reviews, whatever, but that doesn't make a book, right? Right. Um, 
And so, but you, you still have to amass all those sort of facts and, 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 and plot it out. And then you have to sort of color it in with, you know, interviews, with description, um, with, with themes, you know, build, build an architecture around, you know, the, the, the essential spine of the book. And it's, it's a, it's a really organic process. You never know, you know, where you're going to end up. Um, but it's, it's slow. It takes a fucking long time, but it's incredibly rewarding when, when finally you start to see it come together. And so back in 2015, when I was working on it, I was, I was in New York and I uh, went down to Miami to meet um, the woman called Holly X, who was, you know, Bond's girlfriend in 1979, who, you know, songs on Highway to Hell and I suspect Back in Black are written about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and got to, um, you know, spend three days with her, stayed at her house, you know, we went around Miami, we, um, you know, met friends of hers, you know, who took us to places where Bond had, you know, got up on stage and played, where, where he'd hung out for five weeks, where, um, you know, he did rehearsals for uh, Highway to Hell. So I got a real, I got a real feeling, you know, for, for, where Bond had been, you know, in, in mid-1979 and, and heard stories about, you know, his drug use and, and how he was sort of going off the rails. And, and then, you know, you go back and you look at, you know, the physical evidence, you know, there, is, there are still photographs of Bond from that era of him looking pretty haggard at the end of 79, mm. very, you know, bloated and puffy. And then you compare that to how he looked in 1978 when he was at his physical peak. You know, Bond was just like this fucking god, right? Yeah. Something had happened to Bond. Something, something had happened to Bond. Yeah. You know, he just he didn't look good. And and then you know, sort of the those those last few months of or sort of last few months of his life, but the, you know, those first few months of 1980 when. Um, you know, he was in London. He was hanging out with the, the heroin crowd. That was a whole new kind of challenge in itself because I, as I said at the beginning, I, I originally didn't have any intention of even touching that whole death bit, but I couldn't really avoid it. I realised I couldn't kind of just leave it out. I couldn't just sort of accept the Clinton Walker story that was mm. in, you know, Highway to Hell, his book. Um, because it didn't make any sense. And the thing was, I guess, um, Pete Way and uh, Paul Chapman of UFO, who were, were both uh, now dead, mm -hmm. uh, had come out, I think it was around 2005, and had sort of added a whole new sort of element to the story by saying, you know, that they would sort of been involved in Bond's last 24 hours. And Clinton Walker, when he did his update to his book, just completely ignored it. Ooh, and, and, okay. I, and, I, and I thought, I thought, uh, no, that's not right. I think that there's something there. And I, th I, th I thought it sort of behoved me to reach out to Pete Way, Paul Chapman, uh, Silver Smith, Joe Fury, anyone who was sort of involved in, in Bond's last 24 hours that I knew of. And then sort of in the process of doing that, I uncovered a third person who was with Alistair and Bond the night he died. And then suddenly it was like, holy shit, this is like a police investigation. Yeah, I mean that's that's how it reads uh, for a lot of it, especially when you're talking about uh, discovering like the original documents that the actual police and and hospital or whatever it was the city kept, and and how slapdash and and sort of empty uh, that was. One of the the things I find uh, most interesting is you know you're talking 
uh, about having a pretty good experience meeting with um, the woman who dated Bon in his last years. And it sounds like she was open to sharing her story. But reading through the book, there are, there are several people who seem very reluctant to talk to you at all. Um, or were cagey about some of their answers. I mean, when, when you were seeking Bond's story, did you find that most people in his orbit were, you know, happy to hear you were doing this project and enthusiastic about giving you what info they had? Or was it more the other way where you had to kind of pull it out of them or just get outright rejected? Well, I, I'd had the advantage of writing the Youngs before, yeah, this this book. So obviously that made a difference, you know. And, and the Youngs was a successful book. Uh, and when something is a success, people want to get involved with you. Mm. Uh, it was actually harder writing the Youngs. Uh, oh, because okay. Then, because then I had I had I had no sort of history writing music books or anything like that. I was a complete outsider. I'm still a complete outsider, which is to my advantage, though I have to say. Because I think that the problem with a lot of music biographies is that people are too close to their subjects or they're like they have pre existing networks that they don't want to kind of upset. Uh, and so they pull their punches or they leave things out or they don't go, you know, where they should. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not afraid to do that because I'm an outsider. I, my, my interest was finding out you know, two things. Did Bond have anything to do with the lyrics on Back in Black and how did he die? Um, So after writing the Youngs and sort of getting, you know, rebuffed by the band um, and, you know, the the band's sort of existing uh, record company apparatus, I essentially kind of just thought, well, you know, don't even bother this time around because, you know, you're just wasting your time. Yeah. It's, pre- it's pretty clear they're not going to help you. So, I mean, I, I learned to actually kind of put it together by, I guess, going to the people that um, most people wouldn't go to or people who had, who had been approached before and then, and then you know, uh, interviewing them again and finding or getting new, new information that sort of uh, hadn't been sort of elicited from them before. And, um, you know, Christ, I, I would have done 100 interviews or something uh, for, for this book. Um, and, you know, some, some people just give you fuck all. They just, you know, might give you a, a one-line sort of email reply or whatever, mm. and other people wa- want to talk for hours. Like, so I had, oh, you know, probably six weeks of, uh, you know, interviews with Silver Smith, mm. who, you know, before she died. And that, that was incredibly valuable. Uh, Paul Chapman, Pete Way, you know, guys like Michael Anthony from Van Halen. I had a Skype with him, you know. It was, oh, wow. Was, okay. That, that was fucking awesome. I was like, yeah, wow, I'm talking to my <laughs> teenage hero, you know, <laughs> about, about Bon Scott. Um, and, Did he know, and, you know uh, Not really, no. But, oh. you know, he, he they're, they're obviously sort of on the road together, not together, but, you know, sort of in the general vicinity of each other, doing those sort of big, um, you know, arena shows, you know, the, the, the big sort of festival shows at the end of the Right, yeah, there's, a, there's a crossover. There's like a four-year period yeah. where, where Diamond Dave in the, is still in the band and Bond is still in ACDC. That's, that's a golden era. Yeah, but, they, you know, he was listening to, you know, Power Rage on his tour bus and, and all that sort of thing. And he was, you know, talking about how Eddie Van Halen loved ACDC and, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, you know, you can go to those guys and say, hey, you know, what did you think of Bon Scott or, you know, whatever. And that's just colour, you know. It's, it's a nice thing to sort of put in your book. It's like, hey, I spoke to the, you know, the bass player from, from Van Halen. But then, you know, you, you will get to sort of speak to people who really knew him. And they're usually people who are completely unknown or forgotten or uh, I spoke to basically everyone you can imagine uh, who was at Atlantic Records 
in the 70s, you know, uh, about what was going on behind the scenes there. And, you know, ACDC was in, in danger of getting sort of dumped by the record company at one point. That's another thing I remember reading in the book and just kind of jaw dropping at that. But, you know, thinking back, it, it makes it makes some sense, because if you look online at their chart success, really isn't that impressive. Not until after Back in Black. Yes, very, very much so. And, 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 you know, Power Rage was a complete disaster. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it sort of caused, obviously, the, um, the movement to, to get a new producer and, and to uh, parachute, you know, Mutt Lang into the producer's chair for, for, for Highway to Hell, which, you know, was a masterstroke, really. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, a lot of a lot of ACDC purists sort of love Vander and Young. I love Vander and Young ACDC records too. But mm-hmm. um, you can't deny that you know Mutt Lang sort of added a whole new dimension to the ACDC sound. And and you know we've been blessed with Highway to Hell and Back in Black, which are two, two amazing records. And I, I I still. I still probably place Back in Black as probably my, you know, fourth favourite ACDC record. Okay, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, part of the revelations in Bond is, one of the biggest ones is his likely heroin use. And you talk to a ton of people who were on heroin themselves in those years with Bond. And I imagine talking with them must have been one of the more frustrating aspects of the research because it seems that that group gave you some of the most contradictory stories and, you know, mixed up dates. And how did you navigate the hazy memories and maybe, dare I say, questionable motivations of some of the people in kind of that underground uh, junkie circle. Yeah, that was like um, Apocalypse Now. It was like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like, like going down the river, dude. Yeah. Um, That's well, uh, look, look, I... Um, <laughs> I obviously, you know, went to what the existing accounts were of that night or the morning that that Bond was found in the car. And the the main account, obviously, was the statement made by Alistair Kinnear uh, many years ago before Alistair can he have disappeared and is presumed dead? Um, and I went through that sort of line by line and kind of sort of reconstructed, I guess, a, a timeline of events using also the um, the testimonies of, of people who were, were still alive who remembered that, that evening and morning, um, which were... Uh, Silver Smith, uh, Joe Fury, who was um, one of Bond's mates and, and Silver Smith's sort of boyfriend. And he was someone you discovered, right? Joe Fury hadn't talked to anyone else. Is that correct? He was, he was so hard to find. <laughs> yeah. He was so hard to find. And uh, I, God, I spent years trying to find him. Did he appreciate that? Did he want to, did he, was he okay with being, or did he want to be found? Was he trying not to be found, I guess I should, I should word it. Yeah, he's a, he's a curious guy, that one. Uh, really mysterious guy, but he was, he was very, you know, forthcoming and sort of generous with his time when we finally spoke. I then um, contacted Zena Kukuli. Zena Kukuli was the manager of the band called Lonesome No More. 
Lonesome No More was playing um, at the music machine the night that Bond turned up, you know, on his last night. Kula Kukuli, who was Zena's sister, is the, was the lead singer in Lonesome No More. They both saw Bond that night. They'd never really talked about it. Um, Zena and I got into a conversation and essentially um, she then admitted that she was with, with Bond and Alistair back in East Dulwich, right, where Bond had been found dead. Now, this had never come out, ever. Now, to me, that's a fairly sort of significant piece of information that, that there, was another, there was another person with, with Alistair and Bond back in East Dulwich. Um, Kula, uh, who's now dead, uh, she died a couple of years ago. Um, there's an interesting character. She was working as a dominatrix in a in a dungeon. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Still, uh, like all these years later. Uh, well, she she had been a rock singer, and then she got into the um, you know bondage and discipline scene. Wow. Was running a dungeon at the time, and and she's since died. But she told me, look, I don't want to get into any trouble with anyone. I don't want to upset anyone uh, by saying what I'm about to say, but I saw Bond and as an ex-heroin user, Bond looks stoned. He looks stoned on heroin. And she said to me, I don't want to put my name to that quote. Mm. So in the original edition of the book, I'd sort of disguised who had said those words, right, on her request. This time around in, in this new edition, obviously I'm attributing that quote to, to Cool. I think it's significant that, you know, Zena says that she was with Bon and Alistair. And in this update, I have new information uh, that, would suggest there was also another person who was with them. Uh, and this sort of came about through um, a French individual, a guy who had, who had read the book, who had reached out to me on email and said to me, oh, look, you know, I love the book. Um, I'm not sure if you're, you're aware, but, you know, um, some interviews were done in, in, in the French media, in the French language. I'm not sure if you've, you're aware of them, but I can get you PDFs and, and I'll send them to you. And he sent me these interviews, not only that, that, that Bon had done in the late seventies, where he was talking about leaving ACDC, which sort of bas basically corroborated what I was saying in the book in the first place which I got into a lot of uh, trouble over because a lot of ACDC fans didn't like the, uh, you know, the idea that I was saying that, you know, Bon had wanted to leave ACDC, um, which, was, which was great to, to get this sort of, you know, in print. Yeah. From, and, from and, bon and that idea is not like so foreign. I mean, it, I mean, all these years later, Brian Johnson has made comments about trying to, find his way out of the band at various points too, you know? Well, exactly. People do like to do different things in their life. Yeah. And it's not like, you know, ACDC is, uh, you know, Bond's life calling. Yeah. You know, you got to remember he was, he was a, he was a hippie before he sort of went into ACDC and before he was a hippie, he was in a bubblegum band. So he was a bit of a chameleon. <laughs> But that's Bon Scott, with the twinkle in his eye, miming backup vocals on a Vander and Young song for the Valentines in 1969. 
that is always some of the funniest stuff when you find pre like i remember years ago when i first saw pre acdc bond scott on like an australian tv show doing that that bubblegum stuff it's funny you know i mean it's like brian johnson on that uh that Hoover vacuum commercial. The new compact does more than beat. It also cleans, it also sweeps, and brushes right to the edge. Right to the edge. Changing a bag is easy as ABC. The new high power compact from Hoover. It's a beautiful mover. Well, you gotta you gotta remember that, you know. People like to think that, you know, Bond was this sort of, uh, you know, rock god who had lived the rock and roll lifestyle all his life. No, he wasn't. Correct. And, and he, was, he was playing a role. You know, there was, there was Bond Scott on stage. That was his persona. And, and, um, and then there was Bond Scott off the stage who had a completely different persona. You know, he yeah. liked to listen to Steely Dan and read feminist literature. Or, you know, he was, he was a totally different person. And and you met someone, you talked to someone who said that Bond had expressed an interest in like producing or, or recording like country music, right? Oh, Southern rock, you know. That, Southern rock, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Country rock, Southern yeah. rock, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Which he is, was hang, hanging out with, you know, the guys from Southern rock bands and he probably would have, you know, ended up doing something in that space. And I, I, I suspect he would have ended up, probably doing, you know, California girl style David Lee Roth videos in the MTV. Oh. Era. You know, that's, that is a really funny thought. Cause you know, this is kind of a funny thing. You know, I talked to some of my friends about what they think, you know, various rock stars would have been had they not passed away. And one that, you know, we love to throw around is, is Jimi Hendrix and you know, mm. how great Jimmy would have been. And honestly, kind of along what you're thinking, like I sort of think, Jimmy would have had a period in the 80s where he was doing uh, Michelob commercials and synthesizer music, a lot like Eric Clapton was. So it's funny to hear you say that about Bond, because you're right, I could totally see him going the MTV route, and it, much in the vein of David Lee Roth, and it would, it would probably have been really funny, you know, because he had a hell of a sense of humor. Exactly, or he could have done, you know, the Starship songs like We Built This City. You don't know. Oh, yeah. You, do, you don't know, <laughs> right? And um, But getting back to, you know, the update, um, and, and this guy, his name is Patrick uh, Beaumont. He, he sent me these French language articles, and, th and then there was this um, interview that Peter Perrett had, had done in 2009 um, where he said he was with... Alistair and Bond as well. Now, this is unusual because um, Zena had told me it was only her, right? And then we have this interview in French where Peter Perrot is saying that he was there as well. I then contacted Zena again and I said, look, you know, I would like to ask you more questions and I've never heard from her again. Wow. She didn't. She didn't. Res she didn't respond at all. Yeah. So I think that there's a lot more to. Well, not a lot more. I mean, I think I've done as much work as I can possibly do on Bond's last twenty four hours. Do you think there are anyone, maybe alive or dead, that had a vested interest in? Bond's story not coming to light. Do you think there were certain individuals who benefited from this sort of official story of him just drinking too much and passing out in the front seat? I can't say who it was, but I, I, I was, was sent an email by someone who was very, very close to Bond Scott, who uh, is publicly associated with Bond Scott. Uh, and who who people would would trust um, when when this person talks about Bon Scott, 
And this person was saying in this email that, you know, Bond had died of heroin overdose, right? But this person hasn't come out and, and, and said that publicly. Mm-hmm. When, they, when, they, when they go public, they say something completely different, oh, right? That's interesting. Yeah, and it, it was interesting. And I can't use it because it's a, it's a private email, but it's there in black and white. This person saying Bond died of a heroin overdose, right? Yeah. So there's this... There's this story that, you know, is being fed to the masses, which is the, is the story that, you know, uh, you know, Bonfest basically perpetuates, which is, you know, Bond is like... In Scotland, sort of, Bond, you're talking about Bonfest, the yearly celebration in Scotland, right? Yeah, and they fucking hate me, you know, <laughs> and I fucking hate them. Fuck them. <laughs> really? You know, yeah, fuck them. You know, no, yeah. they've, they've done nothing but sort of smear me and, and you know, I've, 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 I've put up with a lot of bullshit from people. The, the festival the bon- or like or, including or the bond go there? Oh, or? no, a couple of the organisers behind that. Um, wow. No, I... I uh, is that a, you know, how about this? Is that a... Is that a- uh, a country thing, you know, because I feel like ACDC is absolutely an Australian band, but it seems they're trying to reclaim Bon as a Scot, and uh, yeah, which is which is complete horseshit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they it's a, yeah, it's look, a small town, right? Uh, look, you know, they they have to do what they have to do to you know revive the the economy of that little yeah. town and whatever. Look, and I don't have any problem with people going and celebrating the life of Bon Scott or, or having a good time. I think yeah. it's a great, a great thing. Yeah. But but also, if you if you are genuinely interested in the, in the human being that right. was called Bon Bon Scott, then be open to the idea that um, you know your your hero got up to some things that um, that you might find unpalatable. Yeah. Such as the fact that he was a, you know, a heavy drug user. Yeah. And, and, those, and those people don't want to sort of um, think about that or accept that. And they regard me as like this sort of devil-like figure. And so I, I've just copped the, the, the most insane shit on social media. Like I've had, you know, Facebook pages set up with, you know, with, with really disgusting uh, memes and, and you name it. Like, and, and had, had death threats, had, had the fucking works. You know, I've had mates go to the FBI about it. Wow. Right? I mean, I'm just, a, I'm just a, a biographer for fuck's sake. Yeah. And, and, and all this because, I mean, the official story is that Bond died of a drug overdose. It's just a drug that's legal and socially acceptable. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not proposing that he murdered people, you know. You're, you're, you're proposing, you know, everything that's backed up by evidence that it was just a different drug, but it's not one that you can bust out at a bar and party with, right? Well, okay, so his blood alcohol um, level was, you know, half of Amy Winehouse, right? Oh. Half. Yeah. Uh, I've had a situation when, when the, the first edition came out where people weren't even allowed to talk about the book or what was in the book or post a cover of the book in various kind of Bon Scott um, groups on Facebook, on... Uh, there's, there's a... There's a a bunch of idiots called the ACDC family who like to think okay. that they're like, they're the custodians of sort of, you know, the ACDC, um, you know, brand around the yeah. world, you know, they fucking hate me too. But, you know, it gets back to the, the title of the book, The Last Highway, you know, Bond had sort of chosen a path of his own, of his own making. And um, he chose to, do the drugs he chose to take risks with his life and and he paid the ultimate price and uh i you know i don't i don't ever say that i've got a hundred percent proof of everything i just sort of present things in such a way where 
I want the reader to kind of look at what we know and then make up your own mind when you, when you have the available evidence, not, not when you have the anointed narrative given to you. I'm, I'm saying, okay, when, when, when I gather all the information together and I put it on the table and this is what happened that night and this is who Bond was with and this is what he was doing and his girlfriend was saying that he was going off the rails and, and, and he was, you know, out of control on drugs and whatever. You know, okay, you put it all together and then you, you know, figure out what is the most likely scenario here. Okay, and we had a, you know, police investigation that was sort of over, you know, it's sort of just after it started, you know, the, there was, you know, a very rudimentary kind of autopsy. Um, uh, no, no documents sort of exist as far as I know, or at least officially, you know, um, from that time. I went to the hospital, I went to the police, uh, you know, did all that. Um, and look, look at look at who the the people that Bond was with that night. Alastair Kinnear was a drug dealer. You know, he was known to be a heroin dealer in London at that time. Most of the people that, that Bond w w were around um, were all in the heroin scene. Well, they're known to yeah. be heroin users. You know, and you know Pete and Paul from UFO gave me their stories and those guys you know, will happily admit that they were using heroin too. And they said, you know, this is what Bond was doing at that time. And it was common in artist circles. I mean, it became much more later on, but like, I mean, Eric Clapton had, you know, just gotten off of heroin only a couple of years before. Like it wasn't unheard of for artists at that level to fall into it. You know, well, exa I, you know, well, exactly. 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 And, and, you know, I, I interviewed Mick Jones from Foreigner when I was in, when I was in New York, I went to Mick's house and we, we spoke about his drug addiction. He's from Foreigner for fuck's sake. Right. <laughs> right. He was, he was fucking strung out on drugs at that time. You, you, you don't think that, that Bon Scott from ACDC, you know, the, the heaviest fucking rock band in the world, might have been strung out on drugs too. Yeah. You know, you know it's just bullshit. I think, um, you know, the, one of the best elements of Bond, The Last Highway, is that what you were just saying, is that when it comes to the end of the book, you state very clearly that you're not presenting 100% guaranteed truth. You are presenting your best understanding of what was most likely to be, which is far more likely and a better explanation than the official story or really anything else that's ever been put forward about it. But you don't claim to be in the room with them to know for sure. I mean, that's what research texts should be, you know, because there's a lot of human history that isn't recorded properly. It's not recorded as in, this is not 100%, this is just our best guess, but it's most, you know, more than likely. You know, people are afraid to, uh, like, cage their language sometimes, and, and I appreciate that you do. Well, exactly. And, and so, you know, with other people who have died in mysterious circumstances, are we always going to accept what is on the death certificate? Yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, like, for instance, for instance, why on the death certificate is there an address that doesn't exist? <laughs> no, it's true. Like, yeah. look, look at Bond's death certificate. There's, a, there's a, an address that does not exist. Yeah. Um, there, there is so much to, you know, Bond's last 24 hours that, uh, you know, it ended up taking me sort of two years to go through it all. Yeah. And piece it and piece it together like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, the remaining sort of mystery, I guess, is who gave Bond the heroin that killed him. Right, right. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that you know Patrick, the French guy, who who I got into the correspondence with, he he sent me his own theory on what happened. So I have two uh, two theories of my own in the book, which you know were in the original edition. And then I put, you know, Patrick's theory in there as well, which I think is actually a very sound theory about mm -hmm. how, how Bond died or what happened that night. 
And uh, look, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong by by trying to find out how 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 someone who we all admire and respect and and love in our own way uh, passed away. I don't think that's showing disrespect to him. No, there's there's not there's not a single thing in the book that makes me think less of Bond. I I love Bond Scott. I'm a fan. I always have been. And that's why I don't understand the the bad reaction from fan communities. I know fans are by nature defensive. I don't understand why you've had a backlash. Nothing in your book makes me think less of of Bond one bit. If anything, it's humanizing. You know, if he if he had a heroin problem, well, yeah, that's real life. There's we all know somebody who's fallen into that, and you know, unless you're unless you just think less of people with drug problems as like on their character, you shouldn't think less of Bond if this was the case. Well, exactly. And, and there, you know, I, I know many people who have, have very ordinary lives, who have ordinary jobs, who also have drug habits. Yeah. And you've, got to rem- and you've got to remember, you know, back in the seventies, you know, sort of heroin, you know, um, it was pretty common in sort of rock and roll circles at that time. And, and, and the thing is they weren't, you know, sticking needles in their arm. They were snorting it. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of people, when they hear the word heroin, they immediately associate it with some junkie in a, you know, grotty alleyway with a needle sticking out of their arm. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what what I'm saying. Bond was involved with. He was just, hanging out with a group of people who love to snort um, brown heroin. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's pretty, pretty well established. And, you know, I've, I've been to and, and talked to everyone that I possibly can that I know of uh, who was, was, who knew Bond, who was hanging out with Bond around that time. Um, who was a Pete Way? Was it Pete Way? I can't even remember exactly who, who it was. It was either Paul Chapman or Pete Way, um, who said that, you know, he had been to his heroin dealer um, in London around that time and seen another member of ACDC walking out. Mm. That's <laughs> in the book. Yeah. Well, you know, and the other thing, what did we learn about Phil Rudd in recent times, you know that guy. Who, 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 was... who I spoke to on the phone, by the way. I mean, people did, like. Did to you say really? That. What was? Yeah. Whoa! How did that happen? Well, you know, people say, "Oh, you know, you haven't spoken to any member of ACDC." I was like, "Well, fuck you!" No, I have. I've spoken to Phil Rudd. Yeah, I spoke to Phil on the phone, and look, he was, you know, not a not in his best way, and and I think he was quite. You know, he was going through obviously a very stressful time, and and if if you remember, uh, uh, ACDC was pretty much hanging him out to dry. Yeah, at the time, at the time, they I remember Brian Johnson and Angus Young doing an interview with Howard Stern where they were basically just laughing about him. It wasn't like oh, we're rallying around our friend, we're you know supporting him in his hour of need. It was like they were just making jokes about him. Yeah. Um, and I th- think at that time, Phil kind of felt like he was on the outer with ACDC and he didn't know really where his future, uh, uh, w- 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 was going to be, wh- whether it was with ACDC or he was going to do his solo stuff. Remember he had a, he had a solo album called Head Job. Head Job. Yep. I remember that. Um, so, you know, his future was uncertain. And I think I, I, I vaguely recall him saying something like, you know, <coughs> um, he hadn't even sort of spoken to Angus at that time. He had no contact with the band. Um, but, look, he, he agreed to uh, to talk about Bond and, you know, it had taken me some time to get this to happen and it, it had happened through his lawyer. Um, 
And when it came time for him to actually sort of formally do an interview with me, he sort of had a change of heart at the last minute and said, I just can't do this. Can't do it. (laughs) And, um, you know, I got, I got a couple of lines about bond from him and then he just said, he just clammed up and just said, no, I've got to go. I've got to go, you know? So, so I did get to Phil. That's, that's the thing. Um, and I've, um, of course, you know, like, you know, I've, over the years, I've, I've had good relationships with people who, um, you know, were involved uh, with the band. I, you know, have a good relationship with David Krebs, who was ACDC's manager, you know, for um, uh, Highway to Hell, Back in Black, for those, to about, for those about to rock, you know, David wanted to turn Bond into a film. Um, you know, at one time, Mark and Ev- Mark Evans and I were, were on good terms. We're, we're no longer on good terms. Um, That's the former bassist who wrote his own book, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a very easy criticism to make, saying, "Oh, you didn't speak to the band. You didn't speak to Angus." Well, you know what the fuck is Angus going to tell me that he hasn't told you know two hundred other people? You know, just regurgitate the same shit. You know. And the thing is, well, what, I, what, I, what I did is I, I went through, you know, things that he had said about Back in Black, you know, and there's, there's a couple of instances where, you know, Angus is saying, oh, you know, Bon had written a little, a, 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 a little amount of, um, a small amount of lyrics for, for Back in Black. Well, yeah. okay, that, does, that sort of goes against the story that Malcolm Young had been telling, which was that Bon had, hadn't prepared anything. Yeah. Right. Brian Johnson sort of tells the same story and says, Oh, you know, uh, he was just getting ready to get together with the boys, mm. you know? And, uh, so why is Angus sort of saying that, you know, there was a little, there's a little, uh, I think what were the exact words? Bond wrote a little stuff or something. I can't remember yeah. the exact quote, but that's what he said once, you know, regarding lyrics on Back in Black. Okay, so there's two opposing stories there. Either Bond, either Bond did have lyrics um, or he didn't. Now, let's, let's just look at the, the history of Bond's songwriting. We, we know that Bond had a... a, a, a a, um, a notebook and that he was constantly sort of working on, on lyrical ideas that he carried around that notebook or exercise pad or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, we've seen sheaves of Bond's um, lyrics online. They've been sold in auction houses over the years. Are we to expect that he had absolutely nothing prepared you know, when, 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 the, when the band was rehearsing songs in the studio? Songwriters always have something. Well, exactly. Because they, they write while they're on the road. You know, I mean, that's, it just, the writing comes when it comes. So if, it's pretty, it's, it's bizarre that they would say right before the recording sessions, he had zero. He had zero, right? So, sorry, no, I don't believe that. Yeah. Um, and I also don't believe it because I have the feeling when I listen to a song like You Shook Me All Night Long that it has Bond all over it. I just can't escape that feeling. Yeah. It's just... The fact is Bond did write one or two lines for the Back in Black album. I know, I saw them. I saw he'd written them down. She told me to come but I was already there from You Shook Me All Night Long as a Bond Scott line. Definitely. No question about it. I speak to Silver Smith, who, who tells me that she saw the line, she told me to come, but I was already there in, in a letter of Bond's. <laughs> and that's such a Bond-style lyric, you know. You, I think a lot of people think there's like this hidden tape of Bond singing it uh, out there because it that song fits so well into our own headcanon, if you will, of what Bond sounds like. Like, if I you know, conjure up, you shook me all night long in my head, I can totally see 
I can totally hear Bond's voice singing that song very easily. You know, even though I obviously I've never heard because that there's no recording of that that exists, but. I think it's why it's easy to believe because the lyrics are so clearly something that he probably wrote. I think early on, I think uh, Angus was a bit loose-lipped. And then sort of things sort of coalesced around the, the, the narrative that they wanted to put out. And you see that sort of writ large in, in you know, the ACDC documentaries, the official ACDC documentaries, and I expect that it'll be more of the same when uh, this, this uh, Bon Scott episode of Australian Story uh, airs on Monday night. I think we'll just sort of get more of that accepted story. Um, I wasn't asked to appear on that program. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, which doesn't surprise me at all. I'm someone who always or has always, you know, bucked the official narrative. Yeah. And that's, and that is the one thing that, that, that flips people off and, and it, it, it puts them in such a tizzy and it's, and it's a real bummer to me as, as just a fan and as someone who respects music journalism, respects journalism and wants to know the actual story that there would be such a bizarre contingent of people who would resent you for that. Uh, I love this book. I, I, I love both the, all three of the books of yours that I have uh, more than anything else because of the work, because you do the, the heavy lifting and the globe trotting and the research and the conversations. I mean, that is so important and that's just not, seen in music journalism that me as a music fan would like to see what what you did with this one is an anomaly as far as i'm concerned so congrats on all the success dude well thank you very much and i but i just want to add that you know one of the most irritating things that people say to me is like that i'm cashing in (laughs) right with these books i mean it it's not the way publishing works. It's very, very difficult to, to make royalties from a book, even though you might have a best-selling book. For, like, for instance, I was the number one bestseller in Denmark with the Youngs, right? To this day, I haven't seen a fucking dollar from Denmark, right? I don't wow. know why. I yeah. don't know why. But I'm not so like, like swimming in money here. Right? Yeah. It's a sacrifice that I make to write these books. Yeah. No, and you know anyone who's in music or anyone who's in publishing will tell you the same story when it comes to royalties and discounting and and the and when when numbers get crunched you know you might sell a lot of units of something but to actually get royalties in your in your pocket um takes some doing and it takes yeah. a long it takes a long time and you have to sell a certain amount of books even before you earn a dollar because they've paid you an advance against your royalties. Right. So, so anyone, you know, any, any author knows this, you know, but I think the public perception is that, you know, the, the moment that, it, that, it, that a book gets sold from a bookshop, you know, that those dollars are ending up in my pocket. It doesn't, doesn't work out. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, bond took me four years. Yeah. To write. Now, I would have earned probably three times more money stacking shelves in the supermarket. But I've chosen to go and write that book because for me, it's what I want to do. It's my calling. It's what I'm good at. It's what I'm passionate about. And I really, really wanted to write that book. It was, it was important to me. You know, I've always been drawn to, you know, stories of underdogs and renegades. Um, and, and, you know, Bon, I felt, actually deserved a, a decent biography. You know, yeah. th- th- he was deserving of one. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe at some point in the future, I might revisit Bon again. You know, um, I still think that there's enough material kind of to put together possibly another book on, on, on Bon. Um, certainly... You know, I probably had 
hundred pages of material that wasn't even used in in the first book. Um, and uh, you know, like for instance, uh, the other day, I I did a, bo a blog on a whole lot of Rosie. You know, and actually, sort of found out who Rosie was. Yeah, that's right. I shared that. That was a great. That was a great story. I and I think that's why, uh, you know. I have a lot of admiration for like your writing in, in general is that this seems to be an ongoing project. Like your website has supplemental material alongside so many of your sources for these works that the, the accusation of cash in that's comical. I mean, I have books on my shelf that would absolutely qualify, you know, but they're, by artists or authors who put out two books a year and it's, you know, the same things again and again that are grabbed, you know, internet sourced and all that. Exactly. Um, and you know. and there, are so many, there are so many shitty biographies like that, you know? Yeah. Where, yeah. where, where, where the biographer, all they do is that they go to Wikipedia and they just sort of copy and paste and fucking rewrite it, you know, pick up the phone, talk to some, oh, what did you think of Bon Scott? Oh, he was great. Okay, well, let's put that in there. <laughs> Yeah. Who gives a flying fuck? You know, yeah. it's like that's not writing. Yeah. There's no, there's, there's no, there's no story there. You're just, yeah. you, you're just typing. It, it, it's, 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 it's not writing. It's, it, it, book writing is, is, is an art. It's a skill yeah. that you know you develop over time. And you know, certainly, I look back at my first book, for instance, and you know, just think, you know, I was just a young guy, um, you know, who had yet to really, you know, learn my craft. But now, after, you know, five books, I'm working on my sixth now, um, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty good at what I do. Absolutely. I guess on the, before we get out of here real quick, you know, you were last on the show with uh, Lewis, who uh, co-wrote Pure Narco with you. Uh, one, how is Lewis doing? And two, is there any news on uh, turning Peter Narco into a into a, a series or anything? Yeah, we had a we had uh, an offer this week actually, uh, which is exciting. Okay. So so we've we've we've, we've got uh, some uh, people in LA working on that and. Uh, you know, that's pretty exciting for us because certainly, you know, bringing it to the screen was something that we had always uh, planned to do with that book. And it certainly lends itself to, um, to uh, you know, a, a documentary series. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, obviously I can't really talk about it. Of course, yeah. But, no, but this, this was but, curious you know, about that. I don't, I don't want to put the jinx on it either because, you know, you know these things take a, a long time to, you know, to happen. And, uh, but, you know, I think, you know, as a writer, I also have to, I have to write books that obviously are going to lend themselves to adaptation into series or films. And, you know, like Bond, um, for instance, I've, I've been approached by a number of producers um, over the years. I had Columbia Pictures contact me at one point. Wow. Right? It was like, oh, shit, I'm getting a call from the vice president of fucking, you know, Columbia Pictures. You know, here yeah. I am in my underwear in my bed, and, you know. <laughs> I'm talking to this fucking Hollywood exec on the other line. You know? and, but this was, you know, right after... Um, Bohemian Rhapsody has sort of done right. so well uh, with the Queen story. And I think, you know, obviously the, the thing in Hollywood at that time was let's, let's, you know, snap up any kind of properties, you know, related to rock and roll and, you know, but that didn't go anywhere. And then uh, I've had a couple of documentary uh, filmmakers, come to me and want to adapt uh, Bond into uh, a documentary or a documentary series. And it really comes down to what their vision is and what my vision is. 
and can we work together and often you know the, the stumbling block for things going forward is is music licensing right That's so huge. yeah so i think it's very possible to make a documentary about bon scott uh without using the music but a lot of people don't want to do that yeah well i gotta say um Congrats on all the success. Uh, I, I just think you're a, you're the high watermark of music journalism, at least as far as all of the rock bios. I got a bookshelf here I could show you full of them. And this one really stands out as a truly impressive piece of research and work. Uh, it follows up the Youngs brilliantly. And like I told you last time, uh, your um, book with uh, Lewis, Pier Narco, is an exhilarating read. I'm definitely going to be on board with whatever projects you have in the future. Looking forward to that uh, that spy story you're working on right now. And I will say in the in the distant future, man, I, I hope you return to music at some point because um, music journalism is important and you are someone who takes it as seriously as I believe it should be so thank you for all that and thanks again for coming on man i always like talking to you you too mate it's always a pleasure mate awesome and that was my conversation with jesse fink author of bond the last highway he is also the author of the youngs the brothers who built acdc and pure narco a book we have previously discussed here on this show i need to thank jesse for being such an incredible guest again, <laughs> and also for the incredible work he has done and still does today. You can find Jesse on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also learn more about the new updated edition of Bond the Last Highway and Jesse's other books over at jessefinkbooks.com. You can also get your pre-order for the new updated version of Bond the Last Highway in at Amazon or wherever books are sold. Otherwise, coming up for this show, our next guest will be Kofi Baker, the son of drumming legend Ginger Baker. Kofi is coming on the show to talk about his Music of Cream tour that's going on this summer. So that's it for me. Thanks for tuning in, and keep rocking. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember the big four things you can do to support this show that don't cost a dime. Number one, listen to the show. If you're hearing this now, that means you did this part already. Thank you. There is an infinite amount of content out there, so you choosing to spend some time listening to this show means a great deal to me. Number two, if you like what we did here, please recommend this show to family, friends, or anyone you know who's looking for a podcast, particularly about music. Share our links in Facebook groups, subreddits, and recommendation threads. Whatever you can do is highly appreciated on my end. Number three, find us on social media. Follow us on Twitter at Play That Podcast. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash play that podcast. And subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash play that rock and roll. Lots of great material, like photos and vlogs, on all three platforms, as Play That Rock and Roll is very much meant to be a content hub as well as a podcast. And finally, the big ask. Number four, please give us a five-star rating and a positive review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. I know this part is a hassle, but it really does help the show a great deal. Not just because it affects the algorithm, but also because it gives me something I can point to when pitching this show to potential guests. The more social media followers and positive ratings the show has, the better chance I have for booking high-profile guests for interviews. So if you take a moment to give us even just a five-star rating, you are actively giving us a tool to do bigger and better things here. But whatever the case, I appreciate any and all efforts you take to support us here at Play That Rock and Roll. Be sure to join us next time for more great stories and music from the world of classic rock.